Cairns, a strategic port. This presentation is given by Cairns Port Development Incorporated, a not-for-profit and community-based organisation. We live and work beside the Great Barrier Reef, applying world's best practice standards to protect it. This presentation goes for about 30 minutes and it's going to share with you all of the vital facts about the Cairns Shipping Development Project, what the port's meant to us in the past and what the port can do for us in the future. I hope you enjoy it. Cairns is a strategic port. Upgrading the port of Cairns is vital to the economy of the Cairns region as it is the largest population in Northern Australia with the largest cropping region, the largest tourism region with the North's largest airport and the location of Queensland's Naval Operations Base and the location of Queensland's largest number of registered commercial vessels for passenger movement, for freight and other work purposes and for fishing. Recent events have made a shout. No, you cannot put an economic cap on Cairns by stopping the future expansion of the port. The Cairns Shipping Development Project starts. In the lead up to the 2012 state elections, the LNP signalled a policy that recognised the importance of upgrading the port of Cairns. On election, the Newman government instituted an environmental impact study into works necessary to upgrade the port. These studies indicated that the cost would be approximately $100 million, placing the spoil offshore, that unless the works were undertaken, the growing size of cruise ships being commonly used would increasingly be unable to enter the port. The current depths are causing inefficiencies for fuel, sugar and fertiliser ships using the port, potentially affecting Cairns efficiency as the Australian Navy's base in Queensland. The LNP government prior to the last election undertook to provide as special funding to Ports North and an amount of $90 million to complete the project. In 2014, the Cairns Shipping Development Project was on track to be delivered. In 2015, it was stopped in its tracks. What went wrong? In the rush to improve mining assets in central Queensland and political outcomes relating to the Great Barrier Reef, the future of the Port of Cairns has been set back. Why? In early 2015, concerned members of the community formed Cairns Port Development Incorporated to support the Cairns Shipping Development Project. The Commonwealth Government, as part of the Reef 2050 plan negotiated with UNESCO, banned all placement of capital dredge spoil at sea and in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. Under previously negotiated arrangements, the boundary of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park had been brought into Cairns Port limits and covered the traditional placement grounds for dredge spoil. The Labor Government to implement the Reef 2050 plan introduced the Queensland Sustainable Ports Development Bill that inter alia allowed the EIS process and any work stemming from it to proceed, but closing the door for any major further dredging of Cairns Seaport if the EIS terminated or after such works were completed. Investigations as part of the environmental impact statement indicated that bringing the dredged material on shore at East Trinity would cost an additional amount of about $350 million. On election, the Labor government released the EIS and announced that they would not proceed with the project. In the process of public consultation, the Cairns community indicated strongly that it was not satisfied with the process being terminated. CPDI indicated that other advice from suitably qualified engineers indicated capital cost of placement of dredged material at East Trinity would only be about 140 million and that over time the cost would be recouped through the value of the land. The EIS process was extended by the Coordinator General. The Labor government subsequently advised that a proposal was being developed for the removal of 1 million cubic metres for onshore placement, either at East Trinity or in the Barren Delta, for a cost of about 120 million. That would allow up to 80% of prospective cruise ships to enter the port. It should be noted, however, that because the 20% of ships standing offshore at Yorkies Knob would be the larger ships, the proportion of passengers standing offshore would be much higher than 20%. The project is delayed again for the fourth time to 31st December 2017, 
although Ports North may release the revised draft DIS in June 2017 to allow public consultation. It's important to discuss the importance of the Reef 2050 plan, Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Listing, UNESCO and local reef tourism operators. The value of the Great Barrier Reef has been used by green activists to support UNESCO's activities to regulate port expansion. The value of World Heritage Listing is mainly a marketing tool. It is not essential to reef protection. That is the responsibility of Australian governments. Although an unsubstantiated value has been placed on the Great Barrier Reef, the real value of World Heritage Listing will certainly be much less. Most reef related tourism is not dependent on World Heritage Listing, as recorded in the TNQ repositioning study funded by the Commonwealth Government in 2009-10. Recently, World Heritage Listing has made the reef the target of very damaging publicity that infers that the reef is degraded, detracting from the value of the Great Barrier Reef. Reef tourism is a small part of the overall local economy and accounts for less than 10% of employment base in far north Queensland. During the GFC and economic downturn, the economy was supported by the agricultural sector worth over $1 billion a year to far north Queensland that is relying on port expansion for operating efficiency. A loud minority of local green activists are supported by international activists opposing coal exports. Coal is not exported from the Port of Cairns. The port is regularly deepened. It was first declared in 1876 with first capital dredging works in 87. Then in 1913 it was deepened, increasing it to a width of 45 metres by 1929. During the 1940s the channel was progressively widened to 60 metres. Then during the 1970s it was further widened to 75 metres and the entrance was deepened to 8.2 metres. In the 1990s it was widened again to 90 metres and to a depth of 8.3 metres. And that was the last time that the Port of Cairns had capital dredging. Maintenance dredging occurs annually and the quantity is approximately 600,000 cubic metres. Cairns has a long experience with reclaiming dredge spoil. Here's a photograph taken in the 1920s of the emerging township of Cairns and you can see the spoil ponds in the foreground of the photo and Trinity Inlet to the rear. And then in the 1940s, you can see the Portsmouth area before reclamation. And in the 1960s, with the Portsmouth Crown Industrial Estate being reclaimed. Marine placement is at the designated spoil grounds, the DNPA, and has been used since 1991 for placement of maintenance dredge material and minor volumes of capital dredge material. The DNPA was located outside the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, however the boundaries were shifted in 2001. Here you can see the port limits, and here is the new boundary location of the marine park and this is the current location for dredge spoil. Permits to use the site may be due to expire again in 2020. The DMPA may have remaining capacity to store about 7.6 million cubic metres. Plenty of studies have been carried out over the decades and today marine placement is recommended over onshore placement as the most cost effective, efficient and long term management solution. These reports record that there is no damage to the Great Barrier Reef. In addition, these reports record two further marine locations. 
although East Trinity has also been recommended as a land-based placement solution, it hasn't been supported by Queensland government departments, although a CSIRO report has recommended that degraded land should be filled and sealed. And now on to the Cairns Shipping Development Project, the proposes to widen and deepen the Port of Cairns. In 2012, Ports North announced the Cairns Shipping Development Project with the following information verified by industry experts. This bar chart shows cruise demand, which is on the increase around Australia. Here's our current situation in 2011. And of course, we've got a range of classes visiting Yorkies Knob and also coming into the port. It's important to note the colour purple, which represents the number of visitors coming into the port of Cairns. With no change in infrastructure and with no Cairns shipping development project, you can see that the number of visitors coming into the port is very minimal from 2015 to 2075. In fact, the blue area, which is the Yorkies Knob visitation, is on the increase. If the Cairns Shipping Development Project is carried out in terms of fuel and channel infrastructure, from the years 2015 to 2025, we can expect to see a massive increase in the volume of cruise ship visitors coming into the port of Cairns. The ships are getting bigger. Here we see cruise ship evolution. Currently, the Port of Cairns receives around 75,000 tonnes. Those were the ships that were being built in the mid-1990s. The Cairns Shipping Development Project is aiming for ships that were being built in around 2000 at about 130,000, 140,000 tonnes. We know that even in the mid to late 2006-2009, tonnages are increasing. Oasis of the Seas at 225,000 tonnes will not be able to enter the Port of Cairns with the Cairns Shipping Development Project. 80% of the mega class cruise ships built since 2008 cannot access the Port of Cairns and the revised project will only work for ships up to 300 metres. The table below shows the vessels that could enter the Port of Cairns under the original Cairns Shipping Development Project, although under the revised project, the Voyager of the Seas will still not be able to enter the port. The original Cairns Shipping Development Project was achieving widths in the channel of 140 metres at the outer and 190 metres in the inner channel, and most importantly, a new declared depth of 9.4 metres. We are yet to know from the revised draft EIS what the new design is. Although we understand it allows ships 300 metres in length and up to about 110,000 tonnes in weight, we must continue to aim to cater for larger ships. The $120 million 1 million cubic metre dredge spoil removal must be stage one only, as it is never going to cater for the new big ships. The original project description from the Cairns Shipping Development Project Environmental Impact Statement also stated some other important infrastructure improvements that were going to future-proof the port for 20 to 25 years. It included the expansion of the Crystal Swing Basin, upgrading of wharf berths, upgrading of landside infrastructure, the relocation of navigational aids, the relocation of the main swing basin to a new location adjacent to Sanrab Point at Admiralty Island, which required the volume of sediment for removal at 4.4 million cubic metres. The revised EIS has reduced the volume of settlement removal to less than one quarter. It is now one million cubic metres, which means that this project is only now good for about 10 years. And of course, land placement forced by new laws and costs is very expensive. 
the current legislation is also going to block future dredging. The actual dredging is only about $60 million as shown in this table below. In 2014 prices, the environmental impact statement was $5.35 million. It's now nearly $8 million. And of course, we've got design project management and statutory fees at $7.7 .7 million. We've got wharf and services upgrades and the monitoring and offsets totaling around $100 million. The revised draft EIS cost is estimated at $120 million for 1 million cubic metres. And if we take off those other costs of the EIS, the design fees, the wharf and services upgrade, and the monitoring and offset fees, we're left with about $74.5 million. We must watch this space in the revised EIS that's yet to be released. And also what's happening today. The 1940s wharves one to five are under temporary repair for a thousand concrete spall sites. And also today, we have the Townsville Port Expansion Project. The EIS documentation for the expansion of the Port of Townsville includes its increasing use as a sea cargo freight hub for North Queensland. Townsville Port is expanding by dredging 11.4 million cubic metres in comparison to our 1 million cubic metres. The cost of Townsville Port's project is estimated at $1.64 billion in comparison to our $120 million. They're reclaiming land to the front of the port, a total of 152 hectares, and of course their new channel design depth is 12.8 metres. We must question whether or not it's part of the Townsville Port expansion to replace services previously offered at Cairns Seaport. Here's a map of the Port of Townsville. The area outlined in red is the extent of the Townsville Port project. And this area has also been excised from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. As mentioned, over 11 million cubic metres of dredge spoil is being removed from the shipping channel. And the project includes reclaiming 152 hectares from the sea. Note that the Townsville Port project also has a marine spoil placement ground, but note that this area is also excised from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. And of course, here's the Townsville port limits and this area sits outside the port limits. The question is, why can't we do that for Cairns port projects? The Cairns port expansion does have an onshore placement opportunity at East Trinity. In the original environmental impact study, it was recorded that 518 hectares would be required for the original dredge spoil volume of 4.4 million cubic metres. When this was analysed by industry experts, the response was that only 320 hectares is needed using different spoil disposal methods. And now with the revised EIS likely to show 1 million cubic metres, then it should need less than 100 hectares. In this map of the original EIS of East Trinity, we can see placement included in these large areas for 520 hectares. 
but only 320 hectares is needed. And you can see then that this is a much smaller section of East Trinity. In fact, this photo below shows that there's a section of East Trinity which is highly degraded. And the CSIRO has reported that the dredge spoil can fill that land and it can be capped and revegetated and set aside for the future. It's important to know that the East Trinity land holdings are owned by the state government over 950 hectares and of course 100 hectares should just be a small drop in that bucket. And of course there are other prospects for land based placement. We've just looked at East Trinity but there's also opportunity on the northern end of Admiralty Island and there's also opportunity in the Barren Valley although we're yet to see any of those details until the revised draft EIS is released. The northern end of Admiralty Island has potential current land values of $140 a square metre. Today Keyport and marine activities includes thousands of jobs and the estimated land value of the industrial area is around $220 million. CAN's long-term growth population projections to 2050 shows that CAN's will be North Queensland's leading regional city. And this is CAN's long-term development options where the Mount Peter area is currently in play. But we must look at opportunities like East Trinity And now we move on to the Cairns Shipping Development Project proponent, Ports North. Ports North must carry out the project, but what's going on at Ports North? Here we see the financial statements as at year end 30 June 2016. Income from port operations is $57 million. The total equity held by Ports North, a government owned corporation, is $300 million. And here is a statement of cash flows. It's important to note that over $10 million is paid to the Queensland Government every year in tax and dividends on top of operating income. This includes 5.4 million as an income tax equivalent and also shareholding ministers dividends paying out at about six million dollars. It could also be noted at this point that very little investment is being made into the port 1.27 million dollars for a 300 million dollar asset. So in summary the 2015-16 annual accounts shows an income of 57 million, equity of 300 million plus tax and dividends being paid out of over 10 million dollars. The corporation has not invested into a major capital works project for over 25 years, although has been paying taxes and dividends to the Queensland Government worth approximately $250 million over the period. Ports North has a strong financial position to carry out the Cairns Shipping Development Project. Cairns Port is a commercial investment 
that has the potential to earn very substantial amounts of additional revenue for Ports North and has the potential to generate substantial amounts of additional economic activity and employment in the community. Funding for the project needs to be seen in the context of it being an investment in an income earning asset. And now we move on to potential revenue opportunities for Ports North. Here is a comparison of fees and charges between the Port of Townsville and Port of Cairns. We can see in these tables that sugar per tonne being exported through the Port of Townsville is $3.93 and molasses likewise $3.93. Through the Port of Cairns $3.18 and the lesser amount for molasses, $3. And we can see that the Port of Townsville is importing fertiliser for $4.81 and to import fertiliser through the Port of Cairns is $3.60. And our LPG is coming in through the Port of Townsville at $6.90, but a lesser amount through the Port of Cairns at $5.34. And also our petroleum products through the Port of Townsville at $6.90 and through the Port of Cairns, a lesser amount of $4.65. Townsville Port charges are higher than Cairns Port, but Townsville Port offer better operating efficiencies. Vessels are larger with more bulk carrying capacity. Cairns Port has operating inefficiencies for port users. This is reflected in the low charges. The cargo shipping values of sugar is approximately 60 to 80 million dollars per annum and for fertilizers approximately 20 to 30 million dollars per annum and it's also a major input into the region's 1.1 billion dollar agricultural sector petroleum products are approximately worth 90 million dollars per annum and fuel is needed in every sector of the economy especially the Cairns International Airport and also in the development of container shipping services. The operating efficiency benefits are presented in the table below and at $40 million seem likely to understate the full extent of benefits over the project period. And now we explore the revenue earning opportunities for cruise shipping. And here's a comparison of the cruise ship charges at the Port of Cairns the Port of Sydney and the Port of Townsville. And here we can see that the passenger charge through the Port of Cairns is currently $6.20 per passenger. And it's important to note that the passenger charge through the Port of Sydney is $30 per passenger. And at the Port of Townsville, we're charging by tonnage over time. It's important to also note that passenger charges at Cairns Airport are about $27 a passenger. And the message is that there's an opportunity to increase the passenger charges at the Port of Cairns. There are direct benefits of moving ships from Yorkies Knob to Cairns Seaport. There are ship to shore transfer costs of passengers shore to city transfer costs, costs of time lost and restrictions on crew taking shore leave. These costs are calculated at $70 per passenger that could otherwise be saved if those passengers came to Cairns Seaport and be earned in part by Ports North as an increased passenger charge at the Port of Cairns. The question is, where would Cairns Airport be today if it had not brought in suitable passenger charges. An economic analysis was carried out for the Cairns Shipping Development Project and its environmental impact study and estimated additional expenditure for cruise ship visits, home porting, benefits to other Queensland ports and construction was estimated at a discounted amount of over $1.3 billion. The undiscounted direct expenditure generated by cruise ship visits and home porting is estimated at over $3.5 billion. 
applying this to the direct expenditure would result in total expenditure generated, including flow on effects of around $5.8 billion. So in the original draft environmental impact study, the economic activity generated over the 25 year project period was over $5 billion and in 2016 values at $3.7 billion with a net present value of $1.3 billion. The cost benefit analysis indicates that the project has a very high ratio of up to 5 to 1 and that very substantial additional economic activity would occur in the region. In closing, Cairns Port Development Incorporated asks for the immediate release of the revised draft EIS and a commitment of $120 million to enable the revised project to proceed as stage one. A review of the Queensland Sustainable Ports Act and Reef 2050 plan to guarantee the ability to extend capital dredging of the port beyond the current proposal. And a Commonwealth Government minor change to the boundary of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park to exclude the site for offshore placement. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our presentation today. If you'd like more information, please visit our website at www.cansport.org.au or find us on our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter. Thank you.